warm welcome to everybody. Um, uh, this is a, a, an event organized by the Italian uh, chapter of the European uh, branch of the Church of the Institute of Arbitrators. And uh, I am here to welcome you because uh, I, I represent the, the European branch uh, being the, the chairman of the branch. Uh, today, uh, this is a very hot topic. Uh, the the panelist, uh, panelists will be discussing the, the impact uh, that uh, economic sanctions are having on, uh, on arbitration. Uh, in particular, uh, this panel will explore the European sanctions enforced against uh, Russian companies and uh, individuals with a uh, particular focus uh, on uh, an anti-suit injunction issued by the Commercial Court of uh, Moscow. I, I don't want to anticipate much because uh, Giovanni Profazio, who is the chair of the Italian chapter, will also be moderating uh, this, uh, this uh, seminar and uh, we'll be introducing a, a, a brief uh, summary of what the speakers uh, are going to, to tell you. Uh, so I, I wish you an enjoyable uh, uh, seminar and I leave you in the safe uh, hands of uh, my valuable uh, fellows of the, of the committee of the European branch who are Natalia, Giovanni and Roberto and of uh, Samuel uh, Richard, who I consider like a guest star. I remember many years ago, I joined uh, a course uh, held by the International Advocacy Academy, uh, of which uh, uh, Richard is a co-founder, and I, I, that was a really great experience. So very nice to have uh, Richard with us uh, in the Italian chapter. Giovanni, the audience is yours. Thank you, Jacopo. Uh, first of all, uh, good afternoon to everybody, to our audience. And uh, I re now realize that I uh, owe some excuse to them because uh, I just realizing that my, my image is somehow a bit blurry. Uh, but okay, I'm not the best handsome man in the world, so it's okay anyway, I think. Uh, the most important thing is to uh, hear my voice. Uh, let me introduce very briefly uh, myself and uh, not the briefly the topic. I'm uh, Giovanni Fazio, I'm the new um, appointed chair uh, of the Italian branch. And uh, in this, um, um, of course, in this vest, uh, me and my valuable colleagues um, set out to implement uh, the common knowledge and understanding of uh, international uh, arbitration by, by um, by um, setting up uh, some seminars uh, and meetings and uh, webinars, uh, lectures and so on. Um, of course, all uh, in compliance with the, the, the CRB uh, general policy. And um, well, um, of course, the policy of the, uh, the general CRB policy is to get linked and get um, tied with the oncoming events and um, the most important event of this year is uh, undoubtedly uh, the outbreak of the war uh, between Russia and uh, Ukraine, as uh, everybody knows. So uh, what bumped uh, in, in our mind is to hold this seminar uh, to understand and to assess, if possible, so far it is possible, um, the um, effect of the this outbreak and the, the sanctions uh, on the on, uh, arbitration uh, proceedings and also arbitration, uh, uh, the role of the arbitral itself. Um, well, uh, I must say that uh, uh, this sanctions itself, and I will not linger in examining, in citing the sanctions, since I think it's uh, now commonplace, everybody knows more or less uh, the, the sanctions. They have been adopted by uh, UA, uh, UK and uh, USA. And uh, the UA um, uh, uh, adopted firstly uh, the, um, the, um, the, the decision number 327, which fo was followed by a package of eight other measures. Um, but the problem is that this is not a new subject uh, in, 
international uh, arbitration field because we have faced uh, uh, arbitration older, older, uh, older than me have been facing sanctions in the 80s, even in the 90s. Um, but the problem is that here the arbitration set, uh, the, the sanctions, sorry, uh, set out by the, 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 the international entities are deeper and I would say also wider in scope. Why I'm saying this? Um, deeper because, uh, the, of, of course, they, 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 they go uh, into the roof of the uh, relation between the, the parties uh, and uh, wider in the scope also because they encompass a series of uh, field of the international trade till to um, reach all import export. In a way, we can say, we can summarize that all import export is a band uh, of, in the relationship with the Russia and, uh, and the other countries. And this is not on a bilateral uh, uh, um, um, ground because the uh, sanctions have been not uh, adopted by only one country, but by many countries and by uh, many institutions. This is uh, a point of difference. Um, well, uh, having said that, uh, I need to focus on uh, um, a recent judgment which um, uh, has been passed by the uh, the court of Moscow. To me, uh, to my knowledge, is a very uh, outbreak. I'm going to say why. I don't want to take the field of Natalia because Natalia is going to, she's going to, uh, uh, to hold her speech uh, just in the matter of the, uh, the, Russian, the Russian party. However, and other uh, um, judgments. However, this judgment is very, very particular because it set out an uh, anti sweet injunction. Very, very, very briefly, the case um, there are two parties, just for the ease of uh, the audience, uh, I shall refer to uh, European parties and Russian parties. Uh, they were linked by a contract, the contract provided for uh, an arbitration agreement. And uh, the European party terminated the contract, alleging the uh, force majeure uh, because, uh, just because of the sanction, because in their mind, in the mind of the European party, the, um, the sanctions prevented them from fulfilling the contract. So they it integrated a force majeure clause. They didn't start the arbitration proceedings. So the other party, the Russian party, uh, um, approach the local court uh, asking for, uh, uh, first of all, asking for um, um, a declaration of illegitimate termination. And secondly, in a second instance, they asked for uh, um, uh, an anti suit injunction, which they uh, managed to have. But the problem is uh, not in saying the anti injunction, the, 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 the measure, so the judgment. The problem is the reasoning. So the issue is the reasoning behind the judgment, which uh, was given by the uh, Court of Moscow. Uh, well, the Court of Moscow, in a way, uh, which, which was a commercial Court of Moscow, in a way, uh, focused on uh, uh, the uh, point of abuse of law, abuse of right. In a way, he says, the, the, the court of Moscow upheld the fact that uh, if the um, uh, uh, Russian party had gone to the arbitration agreement, following the arbitration agreement, had gone to the uh, um, arbitration proceedings, the other party would have um, had a, a, integrate, I can say, uh, um, an abuse of right. Why an abuse of right? Uh, because, of course, the parties are not in a friendly position. Um, however, the judgment, which I'm now summarizing very, very, very briefly and, and in points, is much more recent 
uh, till to um, resemble a, a, common, a common law judgment rather than a civil law judgment. And uh, uh, saying that at the end of this, the reason, the reason uh, that uh, the booze of the right would have been integrated just if the parties had, had gone before this arbitration agreement, which was not commenced, of course, because the only intent of the other party was to, in, was to cause harm to the other party. And particularly, it focused on three aspects. The first aspect is the nature of the sanction, by, by, by which the court held that the, the, the nature of the sanction was, was of a public nature, and as such, uh, was not ch challengeable. Uh, and this, of course, would, rise, would give rise to a point of arbitrability as far as international arbitration is concerned. I'm now quoting just uh, the wording of the, of, the, of the court, which I think is very, very relevant. I quote, restrictive measures are of public nature. It is generally binding and based on the power and authority of public bodies. So for them, the public nature of the sanction would prevent any way, any kind of arbitration, any, any kind of arbitration, okay? And would also uh, generate a non-arbitrability of the case. But there is also a second point. The second point is the countermeasure, because many times, the Russian party, the Russian government, of course, um, set out countermeasures against the European party, the, all the other parties, of course, the European and USA, UK parties. And this also, also this aspect would, uh, in a way, give rise to uh, bias from the part of the arbitrator, so from the part of the panel because still because the party were not in, a, in prospectively in a, on an on a amicable field. And uh, thirdly, the court of Moscow focused also on uh, um, a last uh, aspect, but not less important, which is uh, the aspect of uh, the fair trial, which we arbitrators call equality of arms. Just in this respect, allow me just a few minutes. I'm just terminating my speech. Uh, the court of Moscow focus on the fact that um, um, the equality of arms and uh, um, um, the fair trial can be seen from a subjective point of view, but also on an objective point of view. And uh, under this point of view, the objective point of view, the sanction itself, the sanction was were objective. So they integrated an objective uh, parameter for establishing a not fair trial. And uh, funny enough, they, uh, the, the court of uh, Moscow just cited, that quoted a European case, a, a case with, which was held at the European Court of Justice. Uh, also in this case, I'm gonna cite, I'm gonna quote the passage because it's very important. This I'm quoting. This adjective criterion states that the impartiality of the judge is presumed until proven otherwise. On the other hand, an objective approach establishes that partiality of the judge where there are elements that may give rise to objective doubts about the impartiality of the same, also attributing value to, the, to external manifestations. So, in a nutshell, I would just summarize that uh, 
this uh, judgment gives rise to uh, three very, very important aspects um, in the field of arbitration, international arbitration law. The first being the, arbitra the arbitrability and uh, to what in, in, in brief, to what, uh, whether or not and to what extent uh, um, this, the subject matter of a contract and of an arbitration may be affected by the, um, by the public sanctions. And the second being the countermeasure. So whether or not and to what extent the countermeasure can pose some bias on uh, uh, arbitrators, panel, on the panel, on the arbitrators. Uh, and thirdly, the equality of arms or uh, the civil law uh, um, lawyers call uh, um, fair trial. And to what extent, of course, uh, the um, opposing of uh, um, sanctions uh, may uh, trigger um, they may lead to uh, an unfair uh, uh, proceedings and, of course, an unfair ending of the proceeding with the release of the court. So, uh, having focused on these three uh, themes, I would now uh, call my learning panelists to analyze them in turn. And uh, I'm referring uh, to my first, to my learner friend, learner colleague and friend, Roberto Oliva. She's a skilled arbitrator. Uh, who is going to analyze in deep details the first aspect, and I repeat, the aspect of arbitrability. Please, Roberto, I give the floor to you. Thank you, Giovanni. Thank you for your kind introduction. And I am uh, really delighted to have the opportunity to share with this terrific panel and our great audience some thoughts of mine uh, concerning the arbitrability of disputes uh, in the light of the European sanctions, uh, obviously when they apply considering the identity of the parties or the nature of the, of the transactions. Um, at first glance, uh, uh, the analysis of the issue could start from the uh, sole piece of legislation uh, expressly addressing the relationship uh, between uh, European sanctions and uh, uh, arbitration proceedings. Uh, and uh, it is a European uh, uh, regulation number 883 of uh, 2014 as amended in uh, uh, 2022. And uh, if I read these provisions, uh, I could get the impression that sanctions do not uh, directly affect arbitration. Uh, and it is not by chance that uh, several European arbitration institutions welcome the enactment of such provisions with uh, great, really great satisfaction. Uh, but in my opinion, this first impression uh, is wrong. In fact, the said provision merely states in a nutshell that sanctions do not apply to legal services and payments from sanctioned entities to arbitral institutions, arbitrators, and lawyers. Uh, their scope of application is very similar to that of the general license recently issued in the United Kingdom in favor of the London Court of International Arbitration. Uh, uh, but uh, these provisions, uh, uh, as the British license, uh, do not address uh, the issue of the arbitrability of disputes. Uh, in fact, there is no univocal answer. Uh, for the sake of clarity, uh, with regard to the issue at stake, uh, uh, we can distinguish two main kinds of jurisdictions. Uh, a first kind of jurisdictions uh, uh, are quite more, uh, I, I would say, conservative. And uh, in my slides, I call them uh, uh, type A jurisdictions. Uh, in these jurisdictions, a dispute may be referred to an arbitral tribunal 
only if the parties are allowed to dispose of the underlying rights. On the other end, the second kind of jurisdictions uh, are more liberal. I call them type B jurisdictions. Uh, in these jurisdictions, uh, it does not matter if the parties may dispose of their rights. A dispute may be referred to arbitrators if it concerns an economic interest. Nothing more is required. So uh, with this great distinction in mind, uh, we can make a preliminary assessment of the effects of the European sanctions on the issue of arbitrability. And uh, we can conclude that the sanctions have or may have a great and even potentially disruptive effects on arbitration in type A jurisdictions. Uh, in type B jurisdictions, in contrast, uh, their effects are, uh, are, quite, uh, are quite limited. And so, starting with type A jurisdictions, uh, the, the first example is Italy, which is my own jurisdiction. And uh, Italian Code of Civil Procedure uh, provides that the parties might defer to arbitrators uh, the disputes concerning rights of which they might dispose. Uh, the consequence is that, uh, as a general rule, uh, all the rights concerning a contract are rights that can be discussed before an arbitral tribunal. Uh, but a question arises uh, now. Uh, do the sanction have the effect of transforming a clearly disposable right, such as, for, for example, uh, I mean the, the right to receive contractual consideration or the right to have the contract terminated, for example, for force majeure, uh, uh, are they transformed into a right of which the parties cannot dispose? Uh, uh, Italian courts. Uh, I've already ruled on the point. The Court of Appeal of Genoa in May 1994, and uh, more recently, the Supreme Court in November uh, 2015. Uh, the sanction uh, that came uh, at the time into play uh, were those adopted against Iraq. Uh, both cases uh, concerned the termination for force majeure of the contract. And in both cases, the court's conclusions was that uh, as a consequence of the sanctions, there was no room for, for arbitration. And in this respect, the decision of the Court of Appeal of Genoa uh, contains a very interesting clarification. When we are discussing of rights the parties cannot dispose, we are discussing of all the rights arising out of the contract between the sanctioned entity and the third party. So the right to request the termination of the contract for force majeure, for frustration, etc., is included. Indeed, as the court stated, otherwise we could face the possibility, or rather the risk, that the parties dispose of rights they cannot dispose due to the sanctions. And the same clarification is also contained in the Supreme Court's decision. Uh, indeed, uh, the Supreme Court stated that the contractual relationship has to be assessed in its entirety and that it is not possible to distinguish between the rights of the sanctioned entity, uh, for instance, the, the contractual performance uh, or uh, alleged damages, and on the other hand, the rights of the third party, for example, the, for the contractual consideration or for determination. Uh, in the view of, of the court, all the rights and the interests arising out of the contract are rights and interests of which the parties cannot dispose. And so the consequence is that arbitration is, uh, is never possible. There are also to other type A jurisdiction of particular interest for their relations with Russian Federation in which arbitrability is defined in a manner overlapping with the Italian one. 
they are Sweden and, uh, and Turkey. The Swedish Arbitration Act provides that disputes in respect of which the parties may reach a settlement are arbitrable. Uh, it's a definition very similar to the Italian one, uh, and uh, uh, there is no doubt that the sanctions preclude a settlement between sanctioned entity and third party. I personally am not aware of any precedent on this very point from Swedish state courts. I mentioned two uh, precedent. The Swea Court of Appeal in November 2005 and the Swedish Supreme Court in November uh, 2012. Uh, in these two precedents, the Swedish courts held that two uh, disputes involving Russian parties that could not be settled under Russian law, which was the law uh, applicable to the merits, were arbitrable under Swedish law. Uh, but these are very different cases. And even then, the courts made it clear that a case-by-case -case approach is necessary for uh, such situations. And uh, in this case-by-case -case approach, uh, it could also be possible, I think that it is likely that the Swedish courts would distinguish on the basis of the specific rights that are the subject matter of the parts request. Uh, in other words, uh, they would be prepared to draw the very same distinction the Italian courts refused to draw. And therefore, uh, a Swedish arbitral tribunal uh, could issue an award on the merits, for example, uh, if the claimant is the non-sanctioned entity and it claims uh, uh, the consideration for the services it rendered before the sanctions, or uh, it requests the termination of the contract due to the sanctions. Uh, and at the other end, the situation would be uncertain in case of a claim raised by the sanctioned entity. And uh, in addition, past possible counterclaims or objections raised by the sanctioned entity uh, would further complicate the matter, even leading to, to possible bifurcation. Uh, I am informed that uh, at least in one case, an award was issued in Stockholm in arbitration proceedings involving a sanctioned entity. Uh, the sanction then at stake were those enacted following the invasion of Crimea. And uh, this case uh, also triggered the application of Russian procedural counter sanctions in uh, December uh, 2021. But, the arbitral tribunal issued an award on the merits, and so it held that the dispute was arbitrable. Uh, in the end, it could be concluded that there is a risk that arbitration proceedings in which arbitrability is governed by Swedish law cannot be commenced or cannot continue due to the sanctions. Uh, but this risk, uh, for the time being, does not appear to be high. In any case, I think that this is a point to be noted. Uh, in Italy, arbitration involving a sanctioned entity is unlikely, it's very unlikely. We don't know for sure in Sweden, as there are no decisions on this point, but uh, some issues uh, must be examined. So let's go on. And the other type A jurisdiction where arbitrability is defined in terms similar to Italy is, uh, is Turkey. But uh, there's a question. Turkey has not adopted sanctions against the Russian Federation. Uh, the issue, uh, therefore, is more and more complicated because for Turkish law, no question affects the party's possibility to dispose of their rights. Uh, but it could happen that these rights are not available to a party due to public policy provisions of its own jurisdiction. For example, uh, if that party is an entity based in the, in the European Union. Uh, as far as I know, uh, Turkish courts have issued no decisions on the subject. And therefore, 
there is the risk that the sanctions affect uh, Turkish arbitrations, but for the time being, such a risk seems very, very low. So uh, on a risk scale, uh, considering type A jurisdictions, we have Italy with maximum risk, Sweden with uh, quite low risk, um, medium risk also depends on, uh, on your risk, risk aversion, and uh, Turkey with uh, really low risk. And the, the same mechanism for Turkey possible applies to other type A jurisdictions, such as a number of North African and uh, Middle Eastern jurisdictions, which are in a position uh, very similar to that of Turkey, because they are type A jurisdictions and they did not adopt uh, sanctions against uh, the Russian Federation. And so, sorry. We can now turn to the other significant set of jurisdictions for the type B jurisdictions, which, as mentioned, define the arbitrability of disputes based on the fact that they concern an economic interest. And the first example of type B jurisdiction is Switzerland. Under the Swiss prior international law, any claim involving an economic interest may be the subject matter of an arbitration. And it is worth noting that uh, the Swiss Supreme Court uh, has already examined the matter with respect to trade sanctions. Indeed, uh, the, the Swiss court heard the very same case uh, that was heard in Italy by the Court of Appeal of Genoa in 1994. And it came to an opposite conclusion. Because in the view of the Swiss court, uh, that dispute concerning the termination of the contract between the Italian company and the sanctioned hierarchy entity could have been decided by the arbitral tribunal. In a few words, uh, uh, in the view of the Swiss court, uh, the sanctions did not affect arbitrability, but only the content of the law to be applied to the merits. In France also, is a type B jurisdiction but uh, it is a peculiar one. Indeed, uh, uh, Article 2050 of the French Civil Code uh, set forth that uh, it is not possible to enter a, an arbitral agreement concerning uh, a lot of things, uh, and in particular concerning public policy. Uh, but uh, it should be mentioned that uh, uh, that article only applies uh, with respect to French domestic arbitration. Uh, concerning international arbitration, in contrast, the French courts have a very, very liberal approach. In fact, uh, also French court, uh, the Court of Appeal of Paris, uh, heard the same case heard by the Court of Appeal of Genoa when the Italian company sought uh, recognition of the Italian judgment uh, in France. And the Court of Appeal of Paris came to the conclusions already reached by the Swiss court. It is that the sanctions do not exclude arbitrability. And uh, the decision of the Court of Appeal of Paris is also interesting under another point of view. Uh, besides informing us that France is a type B jurisdiction, it also informs us that French courts would be reluctant to recognize a decision issued by a state court in a type A jurisdiction, a decision maintaining that an arbitration clause entered into by a sanctioned entity is not enforceable. Uh, the same conclusion would be reached in two other type B jurisdictions, Germany and Austria. Uh, indeed, uh, although there are no reported precedents in these jurisdictions, uh, in any case, uh, they adopt a definition of arbitrability that overlaps with that of Switzerland. A dispute is capable of arbitration if it concerns uh, an economic interest. And so uh, the dispute between uh, the Russian principal and its European contractor, uh, which Giovanni mentioned, is, is arbitrable under Austrian law, which is the law of the seat of the arbitration. 
uh, Marty Award would not be enforceable in Russia due to the anti suit injunction issued by the, the Commercial Court of Moscow, uh, nor uh, in Italy, for example, or in other type A jurisdictions where arbitrability depends on the party's possibility to dispose uh, of their rights. Now, uh, moving from civil law to common law jurisdictions, uh, it could be reasonably assumed uh, that the sanctions against the Russian Federation do not prevent a dispute from being referred to arbitration. Uh, the English Arbitration Act, for example, uh, is utterly silent on the issue of arbitrability and uh, the English courts are very reluctant to uphold objections asserting the non-arbitrability of a dispute. Uh, of course, Richard uh, can correct me if I am wrong, uh, which is likely, <laughs> but uh, I deem that uh, this situation uh, is very similar to that in France uh, concerning international arbitration. Uh, I mean, it is very difficult for an English court to follow the doctrine whereby a dispute might be referred to arbitration only if it concerns rights of which the parties may dispose. Uh, but also in this case, uh, in that case, caution is required. Uh, we all know that England is uh, an arbitration friendly jurisdiction and uh, has confined doctrine of non-arbitrability to very narrow settings. Uh, but uh, there is at least one English authority of 2009, uh, which is the, the authority mentioned in the slide, uh, holding that uh, an arbitration clause is null and void if uh, it has the effect uh, to submit to arbitration questions pertaining to mandatory provisions. Uh, in that case, there were provisions of European law concerning the agency agreements. Uh, I know that uh, this decision uh, was uh, criticized in, the, in England, but uh, uh, we cannot exclude that uh, it could be revived uh, uh, with respect to the sanctions. Uh, a similar situation uh, uh, occurs also in the, in the United States. Uh, indeed, uh, as in England and Wales, uh, uh, the Federal Arbitration Act uh, does not address uh, the issue of arbitrability, uh, but uh, the evolution of case law in the past, uh, I think, uh, 40 years uh, is a very striking example of the decline of non-arbitrability doctrine in this field. In a nutshell, uh, a claim would be deemed as non-arbitrable under the statutory regime or the Federal Arbitration Act only where federal legislation expressly requires this result. Uh, so in a, in a few words, uh, uh, and to conclude as my time is, is, is running out, uh, particular caution is required and uh, a case by case approach has to be followed. Uh, this because uh, arbitrability is a very sensitive issue for domestic courts uh, and uh, it is even more sensitive because of the sanctions. So uh, an answer that applies to every international commercial arbitration is not possible. Uh, on the contrary, it is necessary to weigh the specific features of the jurisdiction governing the issue of arbitrability. In addition, it should also be taken into account uh, the risk, uh, which is not a risk, it's, it's more like the likelihood that a dispute concerning a, a contractual relationship uh, between a sanctioned entity and a third party would be decided by a set court, a court in Russia uh, as a consequence of the Rus Russian counter sanctions and the issuance uh, of uh, an anti suit injunction. Uh, by a state court in a type A jurisdiction, uh, since the sanctions prevent arbitration in these jurisdictions and also the circulation of the award 
in these jurisdictions. And by an arbitral tribunal in a type B jurisdiction where the sanctions do not affect arbitration. That, that situation would also imply possibly conflicting decisions and serious issues in their circulation and enforcement. Uh, that's all. Uh, it's not uh, a comfortable picture, I know, but uh, I hope at least uh, uh, a clear picture. Thank you. Thank you for your attention. Many thank you. Very, very many thank you, Roberto, for your accurate. I shall tell you, I must, I must, I must tell you, I may tell you this very accurate and comprehensive talk. However, I have a question for you, if you don't mind asking. For sure. <laughs> well, well, okay. I must say that my question follows my consideration. When I first um, started studying arbitration, international arbitration law, I was taught that the, the overreading principle, the most important principle, which leads parties to approach to, arbitrator, to arbitration proceedings and all the arbitration environment, etc., is the uh, principle of certainty. If I don't get you wrong, if I can, if I, if you allow me to summarize your talk in, a, of course, in less prosaic words, you, you leave a big room, a some room to uncertainty. You know, there is still ongoing. A, 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 a big piece of uncertainty. So, since I know you, and uh, since I know that you are also act as a um, um, arbitrator, but also as a, a counsel, as a counsel, do you suggest any any measure a counsel may adopt to reduce, at least to reduce this uncertainty? Uh, I know it's, it's, a, it's a not easy. It's not easy. The question is easy. The answer is difficult. And uh, the answer is, is very, very difficult. Uh, yeah. I think that parties council uh, may do a thing. They could, uh, in my opinion, also they should uh, carefully evaluate the best litigation or uh, arbitration option. Uh, by way of example, uh, let's assume that uh, I am counsel for an Italian company. Uh, this Italian company uh, entered into a contract with uh, a Russian sanctioned uh, entity. Uh, and the contract contains an arbitration clause for um, ICC arbitration in part. Um, then uh, let's assume that the assets of my client uh, are uh, mainly located uh, in the European Union, uh, but uh, some assets are, uh, let's say, in, uh, in Turkey or in Algeria. I know that there are some uh, Algerian friends uh, uh, connected now. Uh, in this situation, uh, my client uh, wishes to terminate the contract. The Russian party uh, claims damages for non-performance. So uh, what would I do? Uh, I would evaluate uh, commencing litigation proceedings in Italy so as to obtain a decision to be used in Italy and in other possible type A jurisdictions. For sure in Italy, I need these decisions because uh, my client is an Italian company and uh, a lot of its assets are located in Italy. Uh, but uh, I would also evaluate commencing arbitration in France in order to have a decision to be used in France, uh, an award to be used in France and other type jurisdictions. I know that that would obviously lead to objections by the Russian party, objections of list pendants, and maybe at a later stage also objections of res judicata. Uh, but I think that uh, parallel proceedings uh, are the only possible workaround. 
because in this way, my client uh, would have a good objection to prevent the circulation of a possible Russian decisions, both in type A and in type B jurisdictions. I mean, this is probably an additional objection. For example, I think that uh, uh, enforcement of the Russian decision in Italy could be refused also on the basis of other grounds. But I think that my client's interest would be more protected if I could also pose uh, in Italy the Italian decision or the pending Italian proceedings uh, or in France, uh, in Germany, in Switzerland, uh, the, the French uh, award uh, or the pending French uh, arbitration proceedings. Thank you, Roberto. You're Thank welcome. You. Yeah. No, I must just, uh, I just want to say that, uh, uh, you, in a way, you approach the, the situation you know, has to be assessed uh, on a case by case basis. You know, so, you have you approach the matter in, a, in Italian style, I think, because in your mind, in your mind, at least one proceeding should be workable, <laughs> you know? which which is good. It's a very very deep um, answer. Thank you, thank you, Roberto. You're deep. welcome. And by the way, uh, before proceeding, uh, before going on, uh, I have I need to tell because I received a question about um, the materials, and I want to uh, just. Uh, and uh, tell the audience that all the materials, all the references will be uh, handed down at the end of the uh, of the uh, the meeting at the end of the, at the end of this webinar on or in the in the coming days and of course uh, in an anonymous way because uh, even though we know that the parties are known maybe known to the to the to the general public at least to the arbitrators. Uh, our policy is just to keep, uh, um, for the time being, uh, those uh, um, references, in a way, uh, blur. Uh, well, um, now is the, the, the time of our learned uh, colleague, Natalia, and uh, to whom I now give the floor, uh, reminding the audience that uh, um, the issue here, the topic is uh, uh, the countermeasure and how those countermeasure and the extent of uh, which this countermeasure can uh, affect, can have effect on some bias on arbitration, on arbitration proceedings. Please, Natalia. The floor, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Uh, ciao tutti and grazie per avermi oggi. Uh, I'm very, very thankful to Jacopo, Giovanni and Roberto uh, for inviting me. It has been a long time. Uh, we have been collaborating together uh, within the CRP European branch and it is a real honor. And uh, since all of us, we are lawyers, and as Roberto has just proven us, we have to deal with every issue in a very creative manner. And I think uh, everyone realizes that uh, none of issues which have been discussed and comprehensively addressed by Giovanni and Roberto is easy. It's uh, the matter of fact, and you will see from the next um, talk by uh, Richard that not none of the none of the issues is super simple. But we are lawyers, and we uh, create our strategies exactly where we try to find the way which will work. So um, let me um, let me share the slides. Um, I hope everyone can see now, right? Can you? And uh, it has been mentioned today uh, several times. It was called Canton measures. It was called Canton sanctions. And here, when we start, uh, an important um, 
and important aspect, since devil is always in the details, is that when we talk about countermeasures uh, or counter sanctions from the uh, Russian perspective, we are actually talking about particular uh, provisions of the law which have been introduced and uh, they have been introduced uh, by the law of uh, 8th uh, of June 2020 and um, uh, as you see it hasn't happened uh, yesterday it uh, took some time for this uh, for these provisions to be a part of of Russian law and um, Two new means of judicial protection for persons subject to restrictive measures, talking about restrictive measures, we mean sanctions, have been introduced uh, by, uh, into law uh, that time. First of all, uh, the law said that exclusive, uh, it spoke about exclusive jurisdiction of Russian state uh, commercial, or they are also called arbitrage courts, have nothing to do with arbitration, however. Uh, they are simple uh, Russian state courts uh, which deal with their commercial disputes. And so those courts, um, as law said, have exclusive jurisdictions uh, for their disputes involving uh, sanctioned persons. And uh, second, it's right to request prohibition to initiate or continue proceedings in a foreign court, if we speak about litigation, or international commercial arbitration uh, with the place outside of Russia. So, those provisions have been introduced, and uh, as you may guess, uh, since then, uh, there has been quite a substantial court practice uh, for both of these provisions. The aim of the amendments was, um, and there is explanatory note uh, for, the, for, for those amendments, uh, is uh, the purpose, uh, the, the, as it says, the explanatory note says, the purpose of the provisions was to ensure protection of rights and legal interests of certain categories of Russian citizens and legal entities in respect of which sanctions were introduced by foreign states, since such measures actually deprive them, I'm, I'm literally citing the explanatory note, actually deprive them of the possibility to protect their rights in courts of foreign states, international organizations, or arbitration outside of Russia. And then, uh, if we move forward, uh, we have to understand uh, who are the persons subject to sanctions. And here we can say that restrictive measures, uh, sanctions, are described as uh, measures applied by a foreign state, state association or and or union and or state interstate institution of a foreign state or state association and or union too. And then we have two categories. First, citizens of Russia, Russian legal entities subject to sanctions, and second, it's foreign legal entities in respect of which sanctions are imposed and the grounds for such measures are sanctions imposed on citizens of Russia and Russian legal entities. So coming from there, we move to the first um, provision, uh, which is a part of the, actually it's a arbitrage uh, procedure court. Uh, this is uh, the main procedural law by which uh, the, opera the operations of the uh, state, Russian state commercial uh, courts are governed. And um, here uh, in the article 248.1, uh, the exclusive jurisdiction of Russian courts is described. Uh, 
So uh, the provision says that unless as advised stipulated by an international treaty or an agreement of the parties under which consideration of their disputes is referred to international commercial arbitrations outside of Russia, Russian state commercial courts have exclusive jurisdictions for disputes involving persons in respect of which sanctions are applied and disputes the grounds for which are sanctions imposed on citizens of Russia or Russian legal entities. So this is exactly the provision which is being applied by the Russian state commercial courts. And another one, uh, 248.2, says a person in respect of whom proceedings have been initiated in a foreign court, international commercial arbitration outside Russia, on disputes falling within the exclusive jurisdiction of Russian courts under Article 248.1, which we have just discussed, or if there is evidence that such proceedings will be initiated, may apply to the State Commercial Arbitrage Court of Russia at its location or place of residence for a prohibition to initiate or continue such proceedings before a foreign court or international commercial arbitration. So two, proced two provisions, 248.1, 248.2. And what is subject matter of proof for securing the pro prohibition based on the practice which uh, Russian state commercial courts had to date, we can define four main uh, points. It's existence of sanctions with respect to a particular uh, company or individual. It's uh, the facts confirming the exclusive jurisdiction of the state commercial court its existence of arbitration or prorogation agreement on the consideration of disputes which have arisen or may arise in the foreign court or arbitration tribunal. And finally, uh, proof confirming the intention to initiate the proceedings in the foreign court or arbitration or the fact of commencement of the proceedings abroad, including claims, demands, actions, and other documents. So what? Uh, as colleagues have already very com comprehensively described, there have been several cases. Uh, and uh, uh, the case which I'm going to present is, is just not a standalone. It's, uh, it's uh, fairly recent. Uh, we are talking about uh, 2022. It involves two parties, one of which is a Russian business and the other is a European business. And uh, it had uh, the following um, sequence of um, events. First, uh, the company A, uh, subject to sanctions uh, imposed by the EU, in 2014 and later in 2022, filed uh, with the Moscow State Commercial Court application to enjoin the company B from continuing the proceedings in international arbitration. The uh, arguments uh, which uh, company A was uh, bringing to support uh, its applications were as shown on the slide. Uh, company A was saying that imposition of international sanctions on company A prevent uh, implementation or adequate legal protection in international arbitration of company A in view of, uh, first, impossibility to engage qualified international lawyers due to the refusal of law firm with which agreements to, the, to represent have been concluded to represent the company A due to sanction. Number two, uh, inability to pay arbitration and other fees due to um, 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 due to ban on any bank transfers uh, via the international system SWIFT. And third, inability to participate in meetings due to a ban on flights on EU uh, countries. 
to EU countries. And the second point was lack of impartiality and guarantees of fair trial in international arbitration due to numerous sanctions imposed by the EU and policies, a policies aimed at discrediting Russian companies. So this is precisely what has been uh, argued by the company A and uh, later reflected in the court act. And of course, uh, company B responded to that uh, by three arguments. Company B said there are no obstacles for proper legal protection in international arbitration, availability of Russian qualified lawyers, uh, payment through other banks uh, not disconnected from the SWIFT system and participation and proceedings online are still there and therefore why company A cannot uh, just uh, uh, use Russian lawyers properly qualified to use a different bank to pay the fees and to participate online if travel is difficult. Second, uh, company B said the proceedings in international arbitration are impartial in view of its accreditation in the Russian Federation as a permanent arbitration institution by the Ministry of Justice of Russia. And there are several uh, arb international arbitration institutions which are uh, uh, accredited by the Russian Ministry of Justice to date. And finally, the company B said that company A abused its rights by taking an active position in the international arbitration dispute and simultaneously uh, is trying to obtain the prohibition. So it's um, illogical, inconsistent, said company B. And uh, the Moscow State Commercial Court on uh, August 18, 2022, issued uh, the ruling in which uh, the claim of company A was dismissed. And the court said that there are no reasons to believe that the International Court of Arbitration at International Chamber of Commerce is not impartial. There is no reason to believe that their online participation in the proceedings is allowed. Uh, and uh, the, 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 uh, are not allowed, and uh, it's prob perfectly possible. Uh, the court said that company A can use assistance of Russian lawyers, and the mere fact that the bank disconnected from the SWIFT uh, system, a particular bank is disconnected from the SWIFT system, does not prohibit making payments in other ways. So, as you can see, the Moscow State Commercial Court in this ruling fully supported the position of company B entirely on all the arguments. However, the case went to the appeal. So, and the court of uh, second appeal, when considering this case, took a different position. Uh, the uh, arbitrage court of Moscow region granted the accusation appeal by company A and overruled the ruling of the Moscow State Commercial Court of um, uh, in the in the ruling of 26 of September 2022. Here's citation from what the uh, Court of Second Appeal said: from a systematic interpretation of the legal norms and taking into account the purposes of legislative regulation, it follows that the mere fact of imposing restrictive measures, or we call them sanctions are presumed to be sufficient to conclude that the person's access to justice is restricted. So the Court of Second Appeal opted for literal interpretation of the, of the provisions of the arbitrage Code on Arbitrage Procedure. And uh, in the ruling um, of um, the Court of Second Appeal uh, said the following. Uh, when reversing the ruling of the first instance court, um, 
the court indicated that the introduction by foreign states of sanctions against Russian person affects their rights, at least reputationally, and thus uh, deliberately places them in an unequal position with other persons. In such circumstances, doubts are justified as to whether a dispute involving such a person would be afforded uh, guarantees of a fair trial, including those concerning the impartiality of the court, which constitutes one of the elements of access to justice. And the legal position is, uh, for that uh, said the uh, Court of Second Appeal, is set in the Supreme Court ruling uh, for case uh, 309 ES 216955 uh, and is subject to application to its present to, to in the present case so um while uh, the in this case the court of first instance was trying to interpret uh, the provisions of the the of procedural law more broadly and going into the details the court of second appeal as I said, uh, opted for literal interpretation and referred to the earlier, uh, earlier ruling of the Supreme Court and based uh, its ruling completely on this jurisprudence. Having said that, um, I'm at the end of my um, speech, and uh, uh, I would like to reiterate uh, the uh, statement made by uh, my um, distinguished uh, colleagues, uh, Giovanni and Roberto, that we have to be creative these days, and we have to consider all the procedural options available to us to secure the interests of our clients. And um, Giovanni. Thank you, Natalia, for your very, very, very comprehensive talk full of uh, references and case law. I appreciate it. Well, since we are, as a panel, we uh, are uh, deep believers of the gender equality, I have a question also for you, if you don't mind me asking. I don't mind. Good. Well, uh, just um, a step back um, to the rules. Uh, since I think, I still think, this is of course my personal impression, that um, Russia is still a, uh, more or less, uh, um, I'm gonna say, um, a socialist country. To your knowledge, is there any, uh, might be, any difference between the application of the rules, the same rules that you mentioned before, procedural rules, between state companies and private Russian businesses? That's a very I, good question. I know it's, the question is very simple and generic. It's up to you to answer and to maybe to... Uh, there, you, you will not find the answer to that in the court rulings, you will not find the answer to that in the, in the law. Uh, however, uh, you can uh, look at the doctrine and uh, if you go through the, through the doctrine, uh, the, the, the answer is in the, in the, the, the position in the, described in the doctrine is that uh, all what has been discussed does not really apply to the private companies and uh, rather apply to the state-owned businesses. Uh, hence, um, uh, the uh, risks also are much, much higher if you uh, arbitrate with the state-owned business rather than with a private company and maybe with a private company you would not even have these issues and um, the uh, explanation in the doctrine uh, was uh, that uh, prejudice uh, with respect to the private companies is less uh, evident than for the state-owned businesses. And uh, this is uh, because they are not so um, 
immediately connected with the Russia, with the Russian government, and uh, uh, it's only incorporation in the Russian Federation. It's what uh, what what connects uh, the company with with Russia. So I hope I responded your question. Yes, fully. You responded to my question fully. If I can still summarize your point of view, your speech, I understand that in a way there might be a, a little difference. No? Just a yes, little while. No, because you know, everyone is focused, has got in his mind the certainty, because our creation must be certain, must lead to uh, um, an unchange, un unchallengeable uh, award. This is my, of course, my approach to uh, to to all the arbitration uh, uh, worldwide. Many thank many thanks, Natalia, for your speech. Many, many thank thanks. you, Giovanni. Now uh, the third issue of this uh, topic is the fair trial. And uh, as I told you before, the court in, in, the, state, in the judgment uh, that I, I quoted before um, when I introduced this uh, webinar uh, dealt with uh, another judgment released by the European Court, which was focusing on the um, fair trial, or uh, fair trial, uh, I think, is a, a general uh, wording uh, which encompasses all the trial in uh, all the trials worldwide. Um, as far as arbitration is concerned, we call it equality of arms sometimes. Um, well, I leave now the floor uh, to my learned colleague and uh, um, he's, uh, of course, a valuable bar barrister, um, Sam Richard, uh, which different from us, is a, um, a common law lawyer. So he can also, if he wants, uh, give uh, his point of view under common law perspective. Am I right, Richard? Yes, I'm, I'll see if I can do Thank that. Um, in addition, but I'll talk because this is the European chapter. Um, I'll talk also from a, um, a European perspective because it wasn't so long ago um, that we were members of your European Union, um, and um, and so we have a, a, a very similar perspective. And in fact, the, the perspective of the West has been um, very similar and remarkably unified um, since uh, Russia invaded uh, Ukraine in February 2020. Um, the policy response uh, has been effectively to wage a sort of economic war uh, in response. Uh, and it's useful to think in those terms, perhaps, um, because it helps us think in terms of our war aims um, in uh, what these sanctions are seeking to achieve. And although I, uh, I don't know that it's in written in any policy anywhere that I can identify, I think the war aims are to push Russia back to, the, uh, to within its borders. And let's leave aside exactly what those borders are. Um, and we're using economic levers in the form of sanctions, primarily by EU regulation, but also now um, it's very similar um, provisions within um, the UK. Um, uh, we, and those provide those sanctions provide economic levers to achieve that outcome, which um, is to prohibit uh, certain kinds of important economic activity until those borders are restored, uh, at which point I think the assumption is that economic activity will um, uh, begin again and hopefully we'll all be friends again. Um, but until that time, um, the regime that the EU has brought in, it's convenient to talk about that one, uses two principal mechanisms to achieve those war aims. The first um, is uh, through the uh, the designated persons um, regulation 269-2014, uh, which operates a freeze uh, on the assets of designated persons and a 2-1, Article 2-1. And at Article 2-2, there's a corollary, which is a prohibition on non-sanctioned parties from making funds available to 
uh, or economic resources uh, available to sanctioned par um, parties. That's one of the core mechanisms by which these econ an economic war is being waged. And the other was the sectoral regulation at 833 of 2014, um, which effectively um, institutes absolute prohibitions on contractual activity in certain sectors, like certain aspects of the energy um, sector. Coal, for example, is one of them, um, which has been absolutely prohibited. The UK has done the same thing in the Sanctions and Anti-Money Laundering Act of 2018, along very similar lines. Um, now, if I were to stop there um, and consider for the moment the effects of that regulation, that EU regulation, on the substantive law of the contract, the applicable laws to the contract, and here I do, as Giovanni says, talk from an English law perspective, there are probably going to be three kinds of consequence uh, according to the applicable law. Uh, the first is uh, some kind of argument about frustration. These prohibitions will have had the effect um, of making performance of the contract either very difficult indeed or impossible. Um, that might, that an argument might come along in a very similar form under the rubric which is, I think, more familiar to civil code lawyers than common lawyers of force majeure, um, but very much, again, to the same effect. Uh, and a third argument might be grounded in illegality. Um, the uh, performance of the contract is um, contrary to law, and therefore um, the effect at a national law level, the, the level of the applicable law, is either suspension or of the obligations within the contract or termination of the contract without liability or ordinarily um, for uh, the breach that's the, that's the the substance of the of those three um, mechanisms of national law which are likely to operate uh, upon the coming into force of the sanctions but that is subject uh, in i think most cases um, certainly in english law to restitutionary rights upon the um, termination of that contract uh, in order to do justice or equity, let's say, between the parties um, to level out who, who ended up ahead um, or in the money, as they say, in the, in the markets, in the financial markets, as a result, by chance, as a result of the particular moment of the termination of the contract and who ended up out of the market. market. And national law, would ordinarily um, even that out and try to achieve by a restitutionary remedy um, the um, the just allocation um, of uh, benefits received under the contract, taking into account the behaviour of the parties uh, when doing so. In English uh, law, which is um, as good as any to talk about, I think, but because each of these will be reflected in a similar way in various national laws which we're likely to come across um, the restitutionary remedies in fact is, uh, for frustrations in fact a statutory one introduced in the second world war um, at a time where there was an enormous amount of frustration of contracts as a result of the declaration of that war um, and therefore this restitutionary remedy was thought uh, important um, to introduce um, and the ICC force majeure and hardship clauses of 2003 and 2020 seek to achieve a similar effect. In fact, by paragraph eight, I think it is um, the the right to restitution. Illegality, perhaps a little bit less developed um, as a national. It's certainly in English law. It may well be different uh, in other European jurisdictions. Um, but the result is of the application of these national law doctrines, the doctrine of the law of the contract as a result of the imposition of sanctions at the EU level is that trading stops. You can no longer perform the contract or looked at in policy terms, your war aim is achieved, economic activity ceases. Well, let's give a moment's thought then to what are the kind of disputes 
that are going to be likely to come before arbitrators given this broad fact pattern um it seems to me that if sanctions uh do apply then the kind of claim that is permissible or is likely to succeed perhaps that's the better way to put it is the restitutionary claim because for one of the three reasons given the performance of the um, contract will no longer be possible and therefore some kind of restitutionary remedy would be the subject of the claim uh, which is likely to meet success of course if sanctions don't apply then that wouldn't be the true and if 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 the contract is in fact was um, was terminated wrongfully um, when sanctions were, did not apply um, you're going to be in the in the in the scope in the in the area of uh, a claim seeking damages for failure to perform rather than the restitutionary remedy but of course as you may remember there are good faith defenses within the eu regulations which provide for immunity from the person uh, who terminated a contract as a result of a genuine belief that the sanctions did apply which reflects the uncertainty of the part uncertainty that par parties face when making decisions as to um, whether uh, sanctions do in fact apply and how they do so so that um, is a, um, a recipe for a very significant number of disputes coming before arbitrators um, for decision and they're going to be one of, of, of in one of those two natures for restitution or for failure to perform or in the alternative very much very likely and we've seen and some of these things have been referred to during the course of the talks today that there are certain clarifications which have been given by the european commission um, there are derogations which are available now in order to permit arbitrations to um, proceed um, and um, so the process if you like um, can begin um, of resolving those disputes given the proper availability of those derogations uh, or to any particular set of facts which means from an arbitrator's perspective one has to start thinking about um, how uh, the arbitrators can ensure that their award is going to be enforceable at the seat if that's possible to achieve um, and what they need to do in order to maximize their chances of being um, so so being so um, uh, enforceable so as in any other situation they're going to have to look uh, think carefully about the new york convention article five um, and there are a certain number of provisions within that which jump out uh, at any arbitrator as potentially relevant um, paragraph 1a uh, whether the agreement is valid or not is going to be an issue we've already spoken about the uh, the impact of illegality um, on the substantive contract um, 1c is clearly going to be of relevance um, in fact um, and Natalia has already spoken about it to some degree uh, whether the party has been unable to present its case um, and then um, Roberto has helped us with 2a whether the case is arbitrable or not and he's helped us with the way various jurisdictions can consider that and then at 2b whether it's contrary to public policy to enforce the award um, now the arbitrator is not going to have um, power over all of those um because a lot of that is to do with substantive law um which um the arbitrators are not going to be able to influence but the um question of whether the party's been unable to uh present its case um adequately is going to be to some degree within the power or the discretion of the arbitrators um to achieve and so the spotlight will be on that um as a matter of case management if i can put it that way to ensure as giovanni has said an equality of arms not such an easy thing to achieve in these circumstances i think um 
you start, I think, um, by addressing the question of whether this party or either party is sanctioned at all. And to some extent, that's easy because you just look at the list um, of sanctioned individuals. Uh, and that's a, a, an administrative matter sometimes, because sometimes those parties are not identified with specificity. There's a name of a group or a top bank. And the question of whether subsidiaries are involved, also sanctioned or not, is very sometimes very unclear. And there are provisions um, which um, provide for the test to be controlled, which is a very fact-specific um, test as to whether 50% uh, of the company is owned by um, the Russian state or whatever the particular provision um, concerned is. So at, at the outset, um, the, part, the, part, the arbitrator is going to have to try and make decisions um, on the basis of whatever evidence is available to them as to whether uh, a party is sanctioned or not. And of course, the arbitrators have a, a considerable interest in getting that right, because they, like anybody else, if they transgress um, sanctions, they will be in just as much trouble as anybody else um, who is engaging in economic activity. Um, but even if they're not sanctioned, the answer is not quite so simple as then, you know, all gun, all, all the green light and we go ahead. Because, as Natalia has already identified, there's a real problem um, for Russian entities. And I don't mean just Russian listed, uh, designated entities, but any Russian entities from obtaining um, decent legal advice. Because law firms have, to a large degree, taken a market decision that their reputation is on the line. Um, if they represent Russian parties and they have dropped them like hot potatoes, which is something which um, doesn't always um, promote the rule of law um, or indeed um, promote uh, the rule of law in the, con in the forum of arbitration because the pool of people ready to represent uh, the supply of legal services um, does not match the demand for it because there's a huge demand, in, uh, a spike in demand for um, legal services for international dispute resolution and a huge contraction in the supply of it, which is um, a recipe for the kind of difficulties which Natalia was talking about in the case that she mentioned earlier. Um, if the tribunal identifies the fact that the um, the uh, the party or one of, or a party is sanctioned. The question then arises: Does it enjoy the derogations uh, available by the um, by the competent authority? Um, and there are standing derogations which you can take advantage of now, but very often you'll need a specific derogation in order to get full uh, fully ahead. But it's not always, in my view, in my experience, easy to know which competent authorities in which nation states need to issue the derogations. Because a lot of these businesses do businesses in multiple jurisdictions. And um, it, it's, it is a, a burdensome beyond uh, reasonable to apply to all of them. But as things stand today, there doesn't seem to me, I'm not aware of any reliable mechanism whereby one competent authority in a one jurisdiction can, if you like, take a lead role and make a decision on behalf of other national um, competent authorities. I haven't been able to identify um, such a mechanism. Um, and that's led to uncertainty uh, and to people taking, um, let's say, commercial decisions about what's necessary or not. Now, that may be acceptable when you are trying to settle a case uh, and then it's a bilateral um, achievement um, subject to the, uh, uh, the consent of the competent authority. But as soon as you're in an arbitration, with an arbitral institution in one jurisdiction, three arbitrators in three different jurisdictions, 
um, and parties in two other jurisdictions, it may well be a rather more complicated task um, to get everybody to the same point of view about the right number of uh, derogations being achieved um, for the um, arbitration to proceed smoothly. Um, so what's the appropriate action pending the resolution of those uh, issues? I suppose it's a stay. Um, a stay until when? For how long? Um, until those derogation or derogations are achieved uh, or until legal representation is achieved. One can see that this is a problem which will run and run until people are indeed satisfied um, that the arbitration can proceed. Um, and it's only been in October last month, 2022, so many, many months um, after this, um, uh, the invasion happened in February, that the LCIA um, has been granted by OFSI, the Office of the, um, uh, for the, for the Financial Sanctions for the implementation, um, that, uh, that parties have been um, awarded a general license, allowing them a spend, a legal spend of half a million pounds, but only 25,000 pounds of disbursements um, without the need to make an application. You have to self-report after the legal spend is. And once you hit the cap of half a million and 25,000, you then need to make a specific application. Well, as we all know, and some of these very substantial argue, are arbitrations, half a million is not going to get you all the way through to judgment or award, I should say. Um, it's enough to start. Is that enough to lift the stay? What happens when you hit that cap? If OFSI, as it doesn't, um, react swiftly enough to give you your license, they've given up um, predicting how long it will take them to issue a license. They've just stopped it because they simply don't know. They're overwhelmed like many of these other competent authorities are. So what does the arbitrator do once that cap is hit? Put the stay back on? Not clear. There's no straightforward answer to any of, them, of that. Or do you lift, do you hold on to the stay despite the half a million? Because I'm sure these law firms can get through half a million even just preparing the case without actually issuing the uh, uh, the request for arbitration, or do you wait and wait for the express derogation and then lift the stay? Um, and if there's no legal representation, despite the lifting of the stay, uh, sorry, despite the um, existence of the derogation, do you lift your stay then? Is it still possible at that point in time on a complex uh, international contract for a Russian party, let's say not even sanctioned, which cannot access decent uh, legal advice of the, of the applicable law, is that if you lift your stay and proceed, will your award be challengeable at the seat under 1C for a fail for, um, because the party was effectively deprived of the opportunity to uh, present his case because he simply didn't have the legal expertise now to allow him to do so. Um, that is uh, a question which arbitration is going to have to approach on the particular facts of the case as their arbitrations develop. None of those will be easy questions um, to answer, which we can here predict today the outcome of. But that's just the, um, the primary mechanism by which the war aims of the um, economic uh, sanctions can be achieved, the freeze and the refusing to make funds available. But in fact, the sanctions go further than that. And if you look, for example, at the, um, the designated persons regulation, um, Article 11 is a specific prohibition. Um, it's reflected also in the sectoral regulation. Um, which provides as follows, no claims in connection with any contract or transaction, the performance of which has been affected, directly or indirectly, so if one I'll skip, shall be satisfied if they are made by a designated natural person um, or entities listed in Annex 1. 
So here, not only are, is there an, a, a, a prohibition on dealing with funds of designated persons, making funds available to designated persons, there's now a prohibition on satisfying the claims of designated persons. Um, well, um, in respect of earlier iterations of that prohibition, in, um, which was brought in in response to, I think, the Iranian sanctions, or maybe the Iraqi ones, the Court of Justice of the European Union, 2017, in the case of SNH and T and G, was helped by Advocate General Mangozzi, who said, it offered the opinion that it was a genuine prohibition in its own right, a freestanding, in other words, prohibition, which stands alongside um, the basic freezing and making funds available prohibitions. The difficulty that I see is that there is no derogation from Article 11, at least not an express one. So um, seems to me to create some uncertainty about the effect of that. The derogations which do exist are related directly to Article 2, um, or and they they disapply Article 2 in certain certain um, situations. But there is no corollary uh, to that in Article 11. Well, Article 11 has been um, considered. Um, by the English or the British, I should say, uh, no, sorry, the English um, Supreme Court um, at a time when Britain was still a member of the European um, Union um, in a case called Shanning International Limited and Lloyd's TSB Bank and Rashid Bank in 2001. Um, and the conclusion that the Lordships came to in that um, decision was that the provision, the equivalent provision in the um, Iranian sanctions, um, was in fact a permanent confiscation of the of the claim. There was no it 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 killed it forever. It wasn't just a suspension, but it killed the right to make or the opportunity to satisfy the claim um, in per permanently. So, paragraph thirty eight, Lord Hope said this. Um, this is the rationale which he identifies behind the regulation. Um, unless they were protected against such claims, the operators in Iran would have had to make provision against them, those claims, for a prolonged and indefinite period. This would be bound to impose a substantial burden upon them to the detriment of their businesses. Nothing less than a permanent prohibition would give them the protection which they needed once the embargo was brought to an end and the sanctions against Iraq were lifted. So there's the conclusion in that case uh, in relation to a claim of interest um, during the period of the sanctions, which is, concludes that, that this is a permanent pro, um, confiscation, if you like, of, of rights um, to uh, contractual rights. Lord Stein said this at paragraph 26, and it's important to note that the Council Regulation EEC number 3541 of 92 which instituted this um, provision was put in place more than two years after the initial imposition of the trade embargo. It was plainly directed at claims already affected by primary sanctions. So it was, if you like, an afterthought. Everybody realized um, after they made the original sanctions, unless we resolve the problem of claims um, by sanctioned parties against non-sanctioned parties, we're undermining our own war aims. That seems to be the, um, the rationale. Um, in 2020, just two years ago, the English Court of Appeal um, followed that in the case of the Ministry of Defense and Support for the Armed Forces of the Islamic Republic of Iran and the International Military Services Limited, um, where at paragraph 34, relying on Shanning, they concluded that Article 11 had confiscatory consequences. Now, all right, that's where the jurisprudence stands as things are today before the next wave of cases comes along as a result of the Russian sanctions. But if we step back for a moment, just consider where we've got to as against our war aims, if I can continue to describe them in that way. Remember, we 
said at the outset of the talk um, that the kind of claims that would be coming from parties uh, in long-term contracts, probably with, uh, where their sanctions have intervened, would be claims of a restitutionary nature to um, even out the imbalance um, of outcomes which arose at the moment that sanctions through no fault of either parties um, came down and frustrated or uh, was a force majeure event which terminated the party, uh, terminated the contract. With Article 11, Article 11 is directed only against the sanctioned party, which means that if the sanctioned party is out of the money, he's lost money, and the other party has benefited, he's prohibited from having his claim satisfied so that equity is achieved in restitutionary terms between the two parties. He's prohibited from doing that. But the same does not apply to the non-sanctioned party as against the sanctioned party. If he's lost money and the sanctioned party is out ahead, our law allows him to claim justice, a restitutionary, an equitable distribution. So it's a quite a remarkable thing, I, my submission, that a claim for restitution or equity or fairness between the parties is disapplied to one party, but kept alive for the other party. That would seem to me to be inherently unfair. Um, does it, is it justified by our war aims? Uh, I would doubt that because by the time that these arbitrations come to fruition, I would hope that the, um, the, the sanctions are long gone and the economic activity um, has started because we would be looking in terms of a number of years. Um, can it be said where a substantive right is, um, dis is deprived of one party to justice, effectively is it ex expressly um, a, a right um, determined, intended to do justice, if that is deprived to one party only, can that be said to be a fair trial um, in accordance with Article 6 of the Convention on Human Rights? Can it be said, if you are shut out from arguing um, that point, um, that, um, your, uh, that you have had an opportunity to present your case? Is it indeed consistent with Article 1 of the First Protocol on the European Convention on Human Rights? Because it looks very much to me like the expropriation of property without compensation. Well, those questions seem to me to be legitimately raised by the, um, by the nature of the sanctions that the West has introduced um, themselves. And there's not much that an arbitrator can do about it um, because it's substantive law. Um, however, there are certain things where the arbitrator is going to have to make judgments. Um, and one of those things, I think, in respect of Article 11 would be, does an arbitral award itself satisfy a claim? And by that, I don't mean payment by the party upon the arbitral award, but simply the issuing of the arbitral award. Does it um, satisfy a claim? I mean, if you look back at economic resources, the things that you're prohibited under Section uh, Article 2 from providing to a sanctioned party, um, economic resources, the definition of one Article 1D um, is very broad indeed. It means the asset, assets of any kind, whether tangible or intangible, movable or immovable, which are funds or may be used to obtain funds, goods or services. So that's the, that's the economic um economic resources if you have um if you have claim and counterclaim before you as an arbitrator um what is the right approach in terms of in a consistent with article 11 um from a case management perspective of dealing with both claim and counterclaim first of all the claim brought against the uh counterpart uh, uh, the sanctioned party would not fall foul of article 11 so providing the derogations have been obtained you as arbitrator would be presumably letting that 
claim proceed if there's a counterclaim from a um from an uh, from a sanctioned party what is the right approach um do you simply uh, uh do you make no award on that because to issue an award is to satisfy the your claim in damages to crystallize it into a claim uh, to an award in which creates a debt which is enforceable around the world is that the satisfaction of a claim or do you make the award but stay execution on the award so that it cannot be enforced does that bring you on the right side of the line of article 11 or do you simply make the award and leave it to the courts um, at the seat or make no award full of dilemmas for the arbitrator um, in view of what I consider to be um, a uh, rather opaque um, uh, article 11 in all of the major regulations, um, which there has been very little jurisprudence on. So those are my thoughts about the difficulties for arbitrators in um, ensuring the parties have a quality of arms and have their opportunity to be heard consistently with the European Court of Human um right at european convention on human rights there we go thank you richard thank you richard for your insights i appreciate appreciate also the fact that you allow us to grasp the intricacies of um, of the common law approach to to this matter well uh of course you won't escape escape my my question would you I have a question also for you. Okay, let's change the trend. Um, I'll put in a statement and you will comment my statement. Is it okay with you? Okay. Of course. Uh, if I say that by virtue of a, a stratifications of enactments, case law and approach, the common law system has uh, acquired, has reached, as uh, whatever you want to say, a fair, a fair, sorry for the bump, uh, the bump, a fair level of fair trail, fairer than maybe possibly ours. What do you do, reply? It's a, it, Don't be patriotic, it, please. Don't be patriotic. I'll try not to be, I'll try not to be patriotic. It's, yeah. Um, but it's a it's a it's a sort of a chestnut. It is a yeah yes. Sure. It's, a fra it's a phrase um, used to to say it's one of those recurring questions um, which keep keep coming back to which there's no entirely clear answer. But uh, certainly the, the 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 claims that the common law is able to make for itself is that the uh the, the principle of precedent by which i mean stare decisis so a decision a single decision of a judge will bind others is capable of creating certainty or relative certainty through the iteration of cases going through arbitral or court-based systems um because it has the it, 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 that function of binding others, but judges which or arbitrate or arbitrators also, in fact, which come afterwards, is capable of um, creating uh, a greater degree of certainty. I think that the I don't know you, you tell me, but I think that the the I'm trying to remember the name of the principle in um, in and under, under civil code law, but it's it's a it's an accumulation of cases which which um which hold the same thing which are then persuasive uh on uh, on on judges and arbitrators who come later which is another perfectly sensible way of achieving a result i think the difference between the two is that it's going to take time to build up that body of consensus of judicial consensus in a way that it um, that the short the common law can short circuit some maybe wrongly by simply having one um, decision by a, a senior court binding everybody immediately. So um, uh, that's the only claim I think to the fact that the the, the, the common lawyers might have <laughs> an advantage over the civil lawyers. But I'm sure there are a lot of things that I just can't see where the civil code practitioners do a lot better than we do. Yeah. <laughs> 
Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Well, uh, this last part of the uh, webinar uh, is uh, dedicated uh, originally to, to question from the audience. Uh, I don't see any, unfortunately. I don't see any on my, on my board. There's no question for the audience. Can you just uh, uh, ensure me? No one. So since no one has asked nothing, I'm gonna substitute them, okay? And I'm gonna ask for them. Well, in my opinion, um, we, we as a panel and myself, we didn't, we didn't talk exactly, we didn't speak exactly a, a real principle, another principle, um, the one of severability. Anybody knows severability, no? Of course, of uh, uh, our audience as well, the problem of to separate the uh, contract from the uh, arbitration agreement. So, uh, in your opinion, uh, how, how can a sanction affect also the principle of severability? I leave the floor to whoever wants to take it. Well, the, the question is, is interesting, yeah. but uh, uh, from uh, uh, my perspective, I don't think that the sanctions uh, may affect the... Sorry, Robert, I didn't catch you. you. You do or you don't? You don't. 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 Okay. Um, I mean, in, uh, in type, in which I called type B jurisdictions, the, the sanctions uh, do not affect arbitrability, uh, so uh, they uh, do not affect the separability doctrine. Uh, an issue could, uh, could arise uh, uh, in, uh, in type A jurisdictions, uh, such as in Italy, uh, but also in these jurisdictions, uh, um, uh, I don't. I don't think that uh, the sanctions have an effect on the separability doctrine, uh, because they have uh, an effect both on the underlying contract and uh, on the arbitration clause. The effects uh, might be the same. The contract is not enforceable. The arbitration clause is not enforceable. But uh, the reason is, is not that the non-enforceability of the contract has an impact on the enforceability of the arbitration agreement. Uh, the reason is that the same event, uh, the sanctions, uh, affects both the contract and the arbitration agreement. Uh, if you wish, uh, it's a very different situation, but it's similar to that of a contract uh, with an arbitration clause, uh, which was signed by a representative without powers. Uh, the contract is not enforceable. The arbitration agreement is not enforceable, but uh, this is not an exception to the arbitrability doctrine, the separability doctrine. Yes, very, very to the point. Thank you, thank you, Roberto. Thank you, thank you. Thank you, you are succinct and very to the point, direct to the point. Thank you. Well, the time is ripe and we are going to the end of this um, uh, webinar, unfortunately, because uh, if it were um, upon me, I would go uh, hours and hours speaking about uh, international arbitration, you know, no? I, I like it very much, I love it. Uh, but uh, I need also to avoid the reprimand uh, by the general counsel because, because I, I, I cannot ex exceed the allotment, the, the time allotted to me. Uh, just so, um, I just want to um, use these last two minutes to, to say thank you, uh, a real thank you to all our panelists. Very, very thank you, a deep thank you. Uh, you have been clear uh, to me and to, I think, of the audience. I would like also to thank the all audience for participating to this webinar. And uh, of course, uh, we are, uh, me, the panel, and me, we are uh, ready to answer to any of your doubt. You can approach us in, uh, in, uh, in, in our 
uh, email uh, by by email of course um, the others of which are going to be uh, notified to you uh, by virtue of uh, rounding the materials in the next coming days uh, the materials and uh, how they uh, at least a, a summary of our speech for uh, for your ease uh, and that's it I hope that the, the audience uh, have, uh, have enjoyed at least uh, hearing from our um, mouth, even, even though from afar. And we hope to hold another webinar in the next coming future, this time possibly in person. And um, that's it. Bye to everybody and uh, okay, keep in touch with the Italian ch uh, chapter, which I'm honored and flattered uh, to be chairing and uh, to have chaired uh, today. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Bye bye. Bye bye. Have a good week now. And you, likewise.